Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Boudica by Historius Villus. So, Boudica is one of those figures who put up pretty impressive local resistance to Roman expansion. She is, for Britain, what Vercingetorix is for Gaul. And Vercingetorix was a pretty impressive guy. So I'm excited to get into this video, see the exploits of Boudica and how the Romans try to counter them. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out channel memberships or the Patreon, both of which you can find down below, and both of which will give you access to monthly exclusive reaction videos, including plenty of Historia Civilis reactions. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. During the reign of the Emperor Nero, the Roman conquest of Britain was less than a generation old. Yeah, and we've seen some of Rome's history with Britain throughout watching these Historia Civilis videos. I mean, back in, I believe, 55 BC, we saw Caesar's two invasions of Britain, though invasion might be a bit of a generous term. Both of his campaigns went pretty badly. The first one was an abject disaster. The second one was more mediocre. So, though Caesar did reach Britain for the first time, which was very impressive for a Roman, he didn't manage to achieve much. Then you can fast forward about 100 years, and around 43 AD, there was another Roman invasion of Britain under the Emperor Claudius. This one, to my understanding, was far more successful, actually establishing a Roman presence and Roman control over part of the island, which we can see here. And so, now we're in uh, 60, 61 CE, that's when this video takes place, under Nero. It hasn't been long since that main Roman occupation began. Britain still has an opportunity to fight back. I mean, we can think of Gaul under Caesar. This is sort of those early years of conquest, when Rome is really establishing its control, but it's not fully cemented yet. With conquest came Romanization, which meant that Roman immigrants were now flooding onto the island. Mm -hmm. The king of the Essini, one of the independent tribes here, could see the writing on the wall. So when he died, his will designated three heirs, his two daughters, and the Roman emperor. This was supposed- And, you know, of course the Britons could see what was coming. Um, I said the same thing when we were talking about the Germans with the Battle of the Teutonberg Forest. They knew what happened in Gaul. There were trade links between Britain and Gaul, uh, communication, same with Germania, and they saw what had happened. Rome had campaigned around Gaul for a couple years, then it cemented its control, and Gaul had been Romanizing ever since, and they knew the same thing was happening to them. Now, <laughs> as we saw in Germania, the Germans made a very impressive attempt to fend off the Romans and basically succeeded. Uh, the Romans would never cement full control over the region. The Britons are at the point where it's almost getting too late, right? If, if they wait a little bit longer, Rome will really cement its control over the island, so they need to act if they want to push the Romans out. This to be a subtle way to peacefully transition the Essene people into the Roman Empire, while upholding the king's daughters at the head of the tribe. Of course, there's other options to take. If you're a leader of one of these tribes, you can try and push back, or maybe you think it's in the best interest of your tribe, your people, for you to cooperate. You know, you will have to be Romanized, you will pay tribute, all of that stuff, but maybe you can maintain some sort of position within the Roman hierarchy. Maybe that's the best option for you. It didn't work. Mm. The Romans used this as justification to move against the Essenes. Soldiers went into their homes, confiscating anything of value. Many of the Essene men were simply taken and sold into slavery, while the women yep. were raped with impunity. Typical Even the Roman king's behavior. two daughters were raped. And when their mother, the king's widow, a woman named Boudica, tried to intervene, she was stripped naked and whipped. Uh, okay, and this is where Boudica comes in. I, I didn't know exactly what her background was, so there we go. Um... Obviously, that must have been horrifying and humiliating for that family, um, for those people, but this is the Roman way of doing things. The Romans come in to conquer, and they're not going to show any mercy. Burning down villages, taking people into slavery, conducting massacres. 
that's exactly how they did it. I mean, we saw how Caesar was in Gaul. He did all of these things. Now, when Caesar was fighting against his fellow Romans in civil wars, he was a lot more merciful, a lot more careful. But when fighting against, you know, quote-unquote barbarians, as the Romans would have seen the Gauls or the Germans or the Britons, all bets are off. After this incident, Boudicca called for a secret meeting with the Essene leadership and invited many neighboring tribes that had been subjected to similar treatment by the Romans. Yep, and once again, <laughs> we see a very familiar pattern of behavior that we've seen in Gaul, that we've seen in Germania. These tribes attempt to come together, attempt to unify under some sort of organization or a confederation. And this is exactly the right thing to do. This is their best chance of beating the Romans, but it, it doesn't always work, as we know. At this meeting, they agreed to all unite under one banner and launch an open revolt against the Roman occupation. A vote was held, and Boudicca was elected war queen of the United Tribes. Hmm. That spring, we're told that the tribes didn't even bother to plant crops. For months, all they did was make weapons, gather supplies, and wow. secretly prepare for war. They're preparing, when huh? When summer rolled around, Paulinus, the governor of Britain, took a legion and marched off on campaign. Now, if you'll indulge me, I want to follow Paulinus's campaign. We'll come back to Boudicca, don't worry. All right. Paulinus planned to invade the island of Anglesey in Wales, which the Romans called Mona Insula. <laughs> this island was one of the most important religious sites in Britain, and conquering it would be a huge symbolic victory for the Romans. When they arrived offshore, the soldiers climbed down off their boats and started wading towards the beach. When they got closer... And you can see the Romans being on the island, knowing about this religious site. <laughs> Rome knows a lot more about Britain than it did in the time of Caesar. If we remember, when Caesar first arrived, Britain was almost a mythical thing to many Romans. It was this island off the coast of Gaul that no one knew what was there. Some people weren't even sure it was real. Were there mythical beasts? Were there, you know, tons and tons of resources? How big was the island? Was it a whole other continent? People didn't know. And it's been about a hundred years, and clearly the Romans have way more intel <laughs> on what exactly is happening. So they could see that the beach was packed with druids. They were dressed in black, with their arms raised to the sky, chanting in their native tongue. Oh wow. Accompanying them was a mob of women, also dressed in black, armed with nothing but flaming sticks. The women started screaming like wild animals and charged into the water while the druids continued chanting on the shore. Jesus, I always love by the way, the inclusion of druids in real-world history. Because, <laughs> you know, 9 out of 10 times when I encounter the word druid, it's in a fantasy context. So whenever we get a real-life druid, that's pretty fascinating. The Roman soldiers were so petrified with what they saw that everybody stopped moving, lowered their <coughs> weapons, and just stared. They couldn't even process really? what they were seeing. Wow. After a long moment, Paulinus started shouting insults at his men and ordered everyone to charge. That snapped them out of it. It was really no contest. The Romans cut their way through the women all the way to the beach. And when they reached the chanting druids, they cut them down as well. But they slowly realized that the druids weren't just standing on the beach. They were standing on a giant funeral pyre. Jesus. One of the surviving women, still carrying her flaming stick, lit the pyre. And the entire beach went up in flames, consuming the bodies of the druids. It yeah, obviously, these guys didn't stand a chance against the Romans, but I suppose that wasn't really the point. This was clearly some sort of religious ceremony, perhaps a religious sacrifice. That seems what it was intended to be. I imagine this was deeply unsettling to the Romans. I mean, you come to this island, which, sure, you know a lot more about than you did a hundred years ago, but it's probably still quite foreign. The people are foreign. The religion is clearly foreign, and the practices are unsettling and probably frightening to a lot of these Roman soldiers. So, while, yes, you've easily defeated this crowd of almost unarmed women and druids, you might not be feeling super great about what just happened. It wasn't until this moment that the Romans realized that this wasn't a battle. This was a massive human sacrifice, and they yeah. had just unwittingly participated in it. And that would definitely disturb the Romans. Now, the Romans did not like human sacrifice. We've seen some things in the past that the Romans have done that look eerily similar to human sacrifice, like, you know, 
executing prisoners during religious ceremonies. <laughs> but if you ask the Romans, they would say, we don't do human sacrifice. And so this would definitely bother them. To a certain extent, the Romans believed in magic. Omens, witchcraft, yep. oracles, sorcery, superstitions, all that stuff was fair game. They also believed that foreign gods were just as real as their own. Mm -hmm. To them, what they had just done was going to have real-world consequences. What kind of consequences, they didn't know. I mean, we've seen the Romans are obsessed with their omens. In battle, in life, whatever. They always need good omens to go forward. And if they have a bad omen, no one's really confident about doing anything. And yeah, the Romans were very adaptable. In many ways, but their religion was very adaptable. They would just integrate new gods into their existing pantheon. I mean, the Roman pantheon is basically just a copy of the Greek pantheon. <laughs> so clearly the Romans were not concerned about taking gods or entities from other religions and incorporating them into their own religious beliefs. Just after this incident on Mana Insula, there were reports of strange happenings back east. Uh -oh. People said that the English Channel turned blood red. People said that they saw ruins of a destroyed civilization under the Thames River. People said that there were corpses washing up on beaches. People said that a statue to the Roman goddess of victory strangely collapsed for no reason. <laughs> were some of these omens invented by later historians? Maybe. We don't know. But if any of these rumors were swirling around at the time, the Romans would have been predisposed to believing them. Oh, this yeah. was the mood in the air when Boudicca finally launched her revolt. <laughs> Boudicca's first target was the city of Camulodunum, which was one of the largest Roman settlements in Britain. Messengers from Camulodunum were sent to the cities of Londinium and Longthorpe, saying that a massive army was marching on the city, requesting aid. When and once again, I've said this before, I always like to see a city or a country or a people who we can recognize back in ancient times, but are still around. Today we have Londinium, and today, in modern times, we have London interesting to see. When Londinium got word of this, they sent 200 unarmed slaves to help restore order. Basically a slap in the face. Jeez. When the messenger arrived at Longthorpe, they actually took the threat seriously. They sent their entire detachment of 2,500 men to help, mm. but neither force arrived in time. A small group of soldiers in Camulodunum made a heroic last stand protecting thousands of civilians hiding in a large temple. But after a siege lasting several days, the temple fell, and all of the inhabitants were slaughtered. And to be fair, you know, I often talk about Roman brutality against uh, indigenous peoples throughout Europe, the Gauls, the Britons, whoever. But as we saw in, you know, Caesar's campaigns in Gaul, and as we're seeing here, for the peoples of these regions, right, the local tribes, it was sort of an all-or-nothing game. It wasn't just about fighting back Roman soldiers, it was about completely eliminating Roman presence. And so they could be incredibly brutal uh, with how they dealt with Roman civilians. They would often just massacre them, um, burn down whatever they had built, push them out. So there's a lot of brutality on both sides. Of course, Rome is the conquering empire far more powerful? So it's far easier to critique them <laughs> than, say, a local tribe trying to resist Roman domination. But it's worth recognizing that we have a lot of atrocities flying back and forth. The residents of Camulodunum were subjected to every horrific indignity you could imagine. Some were hanged, some were crucified, some were tortured to death, some were boiled alive. Some were forced Ugh. to watch as they were disemboweled. According Horrible. to the Roman historian Dio, they hung up naked the noblest and most distinguished women, and then cut off their breasts and sewed them to their mouths in Ugh. order to make the victims appear to be eating them. Ugh. Afterwards, they impaled the women on sharp skewers, running lengthwise through the entire body. Now, I will say, Roman historians love to exaggerate, so probably a lot of this is extremely exaggerated. I mean, it sounds horrific, but... With this sort of information, we know that there certainly were brutalities committed. Maybe not to this extent, but to some extent. The entire population of the city was subjected to stuff like this. No Roman was safe. By this time, Paulinus was starting to get reports that there had been a revolt. He got his men together and set off back east as fast as he could. Longthorpe's 2,500-man relief force was expecting to just march right in there and put down some local uprising. 
It never even occurred to them that they were dealing with the complete mobilization of the entire Essene people, plus their mm. allies. They were met by Boudicca's forces outside the city. 2,000 were killed and the remaining 500 fled. Jeez. As Paulinus was en route, he heard of this defeat. All Paulinus had with him was one legion, only 5,000 men. He sent out messengers to every little town along the way, calling up every retired soldier still able to hold a sword and shield. He was okay. able to bring his numbers up to 10,000 this way. And that alone, by the way, is evidence of what we were told earlier. There's been a lot of Roman settlers who have reached this area. And clearly, a lot of those settlers were retired soldiers. And this is also a pretty common thing. I mean, of course, we have civilians who were moving to Britain, but also a lot of the soldiers who spent their lives campaigning in Britain, manning watchtowers, fighting against locals, would, after they were done, just retire in the land they had served in. And we're seeing that a fair number of men were able to be gathered from these retired soldiers who had then settled down. There was still another legion, another 5,000 men, stationed in a stronghold to the southwest. Paulinus okay. sent a message to them, ordering them to come to his aid. But the guy in charge of the legion at this time, their primus Pilus, just flat out refused his <laughs> orders. So Paulinus what? was stuck with only 10,000 men, and arrived at the city of Londinium, just as Boudicca was closing in. He told the locals that he didn't have enough men to effectively mount a defense, and mm. advised them to evacuate the city. He offered the legion's protection to anybody who wanted to come with them. And with that, he marched north, followed by thousands of refugees. I mean, look, there's only so much you can do. It would be ideal if Paulinus could have protected the city, but clearly he feels that he can't, so he's giving them the next best option. If you want protection, come with us. Sorry, that's the best I can do you. When Boudicca reached Londinium, she subjected the remaining population to the same treatment that Camulodinum had got. They yeah. tortured, mutilated, and killed anyone they could find, and Jesus. then they burned the city to the ground. Boudicca then took off north, in pursuit of Paulinus's legion. Paulinus was headed towards the last surviving large city in Roman Britain, Verulamium. When Paulinus arrived at Verulamium, he advised the inhabitants to evacuate the city, and said that he would protect anybody who came with his legion, just like before. Then he continued north, followed by even more refugees. Okay, so at this point, Paulinus is marching from city to city as they're destroyed behind him and picking up more and more refugees, which I suppose is good if you're trying to protect the people, which he is, but eventually he's gonna have to fight Boudicca. <laughs> you know, basically what he's doing is stalling. He's refusing to make a stand so far and picking up more refugees to protect as he goes on, but they can't keep running forever particularly if they keep bringing more and more people with them, they're just going to continue to slow down. So Paulinus is going to have to do something at some point. When Boudicca's forces descended on Verulamium, she had it destroyed in exactly the same manner as the other two cities. Yep. At this point, the three largest Roman cities in Britain were simply gone. Jesus. 80,000 Romans had been massacred. Holy. Okay, I will say that is far more Romans than I expected to be in Britain. It looks like there was actually a lot of settlement, far more than I thought there would have been. And destroying the three biggest cities, killing 80,000 people in a truly horrific way, regardless of if the Romans do or don't defeat Boudicca, and they will, this has got to be a massive blow to Rome's colonization project in Britain. <laughs> I mean... Imagine, that would make future settlers, I think, a lot more uneasy to make their way to Britain. And also, you've got a lot of rebuilding to do. So, regardless of how this whole thing ends, sort of the Roman project in Britain has been dealt a serious blow. Which was a huge percentage of the total Roman population of the province. Yeah. The entire colonization effort was now in jeopardy. Yep. Paulinus continued marching north, but now he was nearing the edge of Roman territory. There wasn't uh -oh. really anywhere left for him to go. He had yep, you can't keep running forever. Eventually, Paulinus, you're going to have to turn around and fight. Thousands of refugees with him, very little food, and no hope of receiving reinforcements anytime soon. Paulinus decided to turn and fight. He sent the refugees... Maybe he would have been better off just defending one of the cities he came to. <laughs> if eventually... It just came to this. He just has to turn around and fight. 
without picking up that other legion which refused to march to him, which is ridiculous, but it means that Paulinus, his position hasn't really improved since he reached Londinium. In fact, it has deteriorated quite a bit. Geese ahead and told them to keep walking west until they hit a new settlement near Wales. But he must have known that before long, Boudicca would come for them too. Oh yeah. According to Dio, Paulinus speaks to his men. It would be better for us to fall fighting bravely than to be captured and impaled to look upon our own entrails cut from our bodies, to be spitted on red-hot skewers, to perish by being melted in boiling water, Britain will be a noble monument for us. Fair. <laughs> Dio liked to invent grandiose speeches, but you get the point. Paulinus didn't think he'd live to see tomorrow. Yeah. Paulinus found an area with a forest on both sides that would work as a choke point. That's where he chose to fight. Boudicca's army showed up, and it had grown in size. Our best source from this period claims that this was the largest army that Rome had ever faced, and there's some evidence to support this. Really? In Boudicca's army, the women may have outnumbered the men, and most of them oh, were now wow. outfitted with captured Roman weapons. Now this is fascinating. First off, this army is led by a woman, and a sizable chunk of the soldiers themselves are women. Now I don't know about gender roles and... How society was in Britain at this time, but if we look at Rome or the Gauls or the Germans, these are mostly male-dominated societies, particularly in terms of military affairs. Now, I don't know if Britain was different or if this was just such a unique occasion that they had to mobilize everybody, but that is a really interesting thing to see. In terms of the number <laughs> of soldiers, of course, Roman historians... Uh, and Romans in general were known to vastly over-exaggerate the number of enemies they had to face. So I imagine the army wasn't as big as they claimed, but it was probably a very large force. Uh, I mean, look, we've seen other examples of this. This is all of these British tribes coming together under this confederation, under one leader to fight against the Romans. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of people. The Essini liked to use chariots, but Boudicca didn't have very many, presumably because most of their horses had been taken by the Romans. Mm. Boudicca's massive horde of infantry loosely formed up, and she had her- Okay, so that is one disadvantage. We saw with Caesar landing in Britain that the chariots were a real problem for the Romans. The Romans were great at heavy infantry, but they struggled at anything different from that. The Romans were traditionally not very good uh, with cavalry. In fact, most of their cavalry came from different peoples. Uh, they used auxiliary troops for cavalry, like the Numidians, uh, or a lot of Gallic tribes served as Roman cavalry. And the chariots, um, of course, a little different than cavalry, but also very mobile. That's one of the best things about them. Of course, the Romans also had a big tr problem with those. They really struggled to fight against them. So the fact that Boudicca doesn't have chariots, that's a plus for the Romans. Also, with so many people, it's going to be really hard to organize them effectively. So I imagine this force, as it's been shown here, was probably rather disorganized compared to the Romans. There are far, far, far less of them, but we're talking about the Roman infantry here. The legions, these are some of the most organized, disciplined soldiers the world will ever see. So, of course, Rome has a massive disadvantage in terms of the numbers of soldiers. That's undeniable. They do have some advantages, though. Her supply wagons brought in and put in a semicircle behind her line. Some people think that this was for non-combatants to watch the battle, but that's kind of a trope in Roman history without a lot of evidence attached to it. Mm. I think that it was to prevent the Romans from escaping. Boudicca's forces closed in, and when they were in range, the Romans let loose with their javelins. When they were out of javelins, the Roman infantry formed up into three wedge-like formations, and then, without warning, they charged at full speed into Boudicca's line. Damn, they're Paulinus going for it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I thought Paulinus was going to play this more defensively. He's got this defensive position. They're just going to try and hold off the Britons for as long as possible and hope that after enough death, they'll be worn down enough to retreat. But he's going for a full-on offensive. I respect that. We'll see how it goes. This anticipated that they would immediately be surrounded, which is exactly what happened. But mm. the wedges allowed them to fight in several directions at once. 
Even though they were surrounded, they relentlessly moved forward, hacking Smart. through multitudes of Iceni. Boudicca's surrounding forces bombarded the Romans with arrows, javelins, and stones from... This is very interesting. The Romans are outnumbered so badly that I guess Paulinus figured it was inevitable that they would be surrounded, <laughs> which is usually absolutely terrible in a battle. You're surrounded, you're done for. But in this instance, Paulinus says, you know what? Screw it. We're going to be surrounded. Let us be surrounded. You know what we're going to do? We're going to make a formation that allows us to fight on every side. You know, these sort of spear tip formations. And we're going to push as fast as we can. Very interesting strategy, but I, I respect doing it a little differently, looking at the situation you're in and saying, you know what, we're going to have to do it this way, and then just going for it. From all directions, but the Asini were not used to fighting heavy infantry, and most yep. of the missiles were light enough to bounce off Roman shields and armor. Boudicca ordered the few chariots at her disposal to charge into the Roman line several times. Yeah, as we saw from Caesar's attempts to conquer Britain, and it's been a hundred years, <laughs> so I don't know how much has changed, but it seems like the Britons may be relatively similar in terms of fighting style. They primarily relied on chariots. Boudicca doesn't have a lot of those. And aside from chariots, a lot of fairly light soldiers, a lot of skirmishers, you know, the Britons were a pretty mobile, quick-moving force, and when they had their chariots, all of their chariots, the Romans really struggled, but if you have skirmishers, light soldiers, and not that many chariots, up against the Romans' very disciplined heavy infantry, you might have a bit of a harder time. But the Romans would just tighten up, hold their ground, and continue pushing forward. Mm. After continuing like this all day, there was a break. The Asini were frustrated and exhausted by the Romans' unstoppable machine-like momentum, and they <laughs> tried to pull back. They started to run into their own wagons, uh -oh. which caused a bit of a traffic jam. Before long, a serious situation developed, where there was a huge crush of Asini pushed- Oh no. See, this could have been a more orderly retreat. Once again, it seems like the Asini are rather disorganized, but if, you know, there wasn't any blockage <laughs> in their rear, they could have retreated, reformed, and fought another day. But because of this, they are in a lot of trouble. Up against the wagons, and they couldn't move. The Romans charged into this mass of humanity, and- a And, by the way, even without the Romans there, we know how dangerous a crush can be. If you have a crowd packed in too tight a space, you know, people are gonna be crushing into each other, people are gonna be suffocating, being trampled, Already a really dangerous situation. Not to mention, <laughs> you've got a bunch of Roman heavy infantry coming up on your rear. Well, it was the front, but now you're retreating, so it's your rear. Um, you're in a lot of trouble. A battle that could have been a stalemate instantaneously turned into a slaughter. Yeah. The Romans didn't differentiate between man, woman, child, horse, pack animal. They killed everything that moved. Yeah. Boudicca and some others would escape the slaughter, but she would take her own life by drinking poison a few days later. Mm. We're told that including the children and non-combatants, a little less than 80,000 of the Asini were killed. Jesus. The Romans claimed that only 400 were killed and another 400 wounded, but that seems really low considering the nature and duration of the fighting. Yeah, look, we know that the Romans like to over-exaggerate the number of enemies they fought, they also liked to under-exaggerate <laughs> the number of men that they lost. So we can assume that they didn't fight as many Asini as they claimed they did, and that they lost more men than they claimed they did. In the immediate aftermath, the Romans would do an emergency transfer of 6,000 additional soldiers to Britain, so make of that what you will. Mm. And with that, the Roman colonization of Britain was pulled back from the brink. The Emperor Nero briefly thought about abandoning the entire island, but that idea died when he did. The Romans would occupy Britain for the next 300 years, but this was the largest conflict to ever occur on British soil. Yeah. And, I mean, look, Boudicca actually got close to destroying the Roman colonization project. I mean, they lost the battle. Uh, it went terribly for them. It could have been more of a stalemate. But even after that, Nero was thinking about ending the entire project, and when you face such massive losses, it wouldn't even be unreasonable <laughs> to back away from Britain. Of course, the Romans didn't, and as they said, 
the island would be occupied for hundreds of years afterwards. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting one. Like I said, Boudicca is remembered as one of these sort of folk heroes who fought back against Rome. Failed in the end, but made a valiant effort. Uh, I think Vercingetorix is more worthy of the title. Um, you know, seems like he fought back a little more impressively. <laughs> he had a better chance. Uh, I think he fought a little more intelligently. Um, it seems like Boudicca marched around massacring Roman civilians in cities and then fought this one big battle that went terribly. But, you know, there's, they're remembered for these particular reasons. I know Vercingetorix is remembered to a certain extent in France for his exploits. I don't know how much Boudicca is remembered. Um, growing up in Scotland, I never heard of her, but, uh, of course, we have our own pride about not being conquered by the Romans, so maybe in England she's remembered. I'm curious uh, if any of you uh, are English out there, if you've ever heard of Boudicca, um, just in sort of common conversation or popular culture, or learned about her in history class or something. I have no idea. Uh, I certainly didn't, but you might have. Uh, anyway, that was an interesting one. If you guys enjoyed, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon and channel memberships for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.